Hi, Dr. Bush and Dr. Snodgrass here at the Hypospadias Specialty Center, and we haven't shown you guys a distal hypospadias repair in a while, so we thought today would be a good day for that. So here's a boy with distal hypospadias, and we always start out by putting in a sound, and you see that the, the, the vernacular is to say he doesn't have a thin urethra. What we're really saying is he's got good dartos over the urethra. And we start our skin incision a little differently now because we see so much curvature. We don't suspect that this patient has curvature based on our pre-op exam, but we thought it was a re it's a really good idea to just get into the habit of degloving ventrally. Number one, this is an important step for those of you who live in countries where foreskin reconstruction should be the norm in hypospadias patients. And number two, because up to about a third of patients with distal hypospadias can have significant curvature, this is a, a very good way to start your incision so that you don't make a wrong decision. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second as we, we're putting in stays in the corners of the prep use the way you would if you were doing a perpucioplasty. And that's in case we were to encounter 30 degrees of curvature or more. Yep. Yep. I can't say because before. that that changes our approach. But today we're talking about this distal hypospadias, and we have learned that the number of boys with distal hypospadias who have curvature that's 30 degrees or greater is actually, as she said, about a third of them. And that's a kind of, that was a surprise, but that's what happens when you start objectively measuring curvature and you realize that it's worse than what you maybe thought in the past when you just eyeballed it. And if you look where the meatus is and you decide in your head, well, that's just a distal, and then you see curvature and you don't measure it, then you may be likely to discount it. So I, that's nothing, we can put an application there. And, and we see the consequences of that decision pretty commonly in our practice because it doesn't work. And so those boys end up with complications post-operatively because the wrong operation was done. So we're just going to show you this ventral incision So I always mark the midline of the scrotum. It's an easy place to extend your dissection. And for this boy, because this is so short and his scrotum is kind of hiked up, we're really gonna wanna drop that down to a more orthotopic position. We're gonna go, of course, straight through the median refe that's already here. But this is where you have to start being a little bit careful. So we're in essence gonna be creating furlet skirts, but kind of from the opposite direction is really the way to think about it. And so you want to know where your glands is. And really what we're trying to do is make sure that we stay a consistent distance below the level of the glands as we extend these kind of wings out that we have here because what we don't wanna do is for shorten our skin, like this needs to, be, to go down maybe just a little bit lower right here so that that distance is consistent right there. And then if we need more room, we can easily go up and down our wing. And this, again, is just the furlet skirt that you would create, but you're used to doing it from the, from other, the other direction. And so we just wanted to show you how that works from, from this direction, because this is how we start anybody that we have a suspicion of curvature on. And then because we're here and, and it's easy and it will help us to direct things, we're gonna go ahead and mark our glands, wings, and our urethral plate because we know that that's a fair um, place to make a skin incision if we need to. That's gonna essentially come down here and here on either side. And that's gonna preserve just a little bit more skin for us than um, than if we need to give ourselves some more degloving room. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of how we're starting our incision. Yeah, but we often do that. So we'll come right on the inside of that. 
right here is what he's saying. Yeah, the, that I lip is there went to the side marker. And I think that's an important point because we mark right where the visual junction is. We don't it's go right wider. There. Yeah, so it's, it's a tiny little adjustment. But, but those millimeters do make, make a, a difference. huge difference. And this kid, um, no, this kid has some torsion just a little bit. He's kind of facing this direction instead of six o'clock and you can see that's eccentric with the um, median raffe, which is kind of coming right along where this gland swing is. And that's all stuff that we want to correct in the process of this surgery. So we're going to go very, very superficially on either side here so that we're not getting into spongiosum and that we're preserving our ventral dartos for a later barrier layer. For him, we don't really need to go much more into the scrotum at this point because we don't suspect we're going to need it. But we're going to need just a little bit more room, which is why we'll go down these furlet skirts that we created. And that should give us plenty of working room here. When we deglove, just like you've seen us do in our other distal tip videos, we want to stay very superficial so that we preserve dartos on the penis and spongiosum, which will be our barrier layer after we complete our urethroplasty. So the point of dissection, as she said, is just right under the skin. And it, you notice it once again that we don't have a catheter in the urethra it's okay if you want to put one in but but we just don't and and are superstitious that it lifts the urethra up towards where you're operating whereas the way that we're doing it the urethra is dropping down away from us so we're not going to injure it and and then we don't have to mess with it because you know it falls out gets in your way. Going through here so. to really drop this skin downward. There we go. You can see these tension bands right here and that's going to give you the majority of your length to come right along the skin and to drop that down. But you have to be really careful with this incision that you don't inadvertently injure your mucosal collar so you want to stay again really close to the skin which also helps you preserve your dartos. dartos. It's it's kind of fun that here we are doing a distal repair through a different incision than we were used to doing and so you see things from a different perspective than you did before. I thought it'd be fun for you to watch that. In some ways, actually, instead of holding the penis the way I used to, if you look at old videos, this way, you know, we both are seeing it clearly, and it's just a different way to dissect to get the, the operation started. The people who trained with me have heard me say many times, the presence of a penis isn't the reason to do a degloving that not every penis needs to be fully degloved. We anticipate we will be doing that in him, but we don't have to start out with it. And we have been surprised in some boys, many of the boys who do have 30 degrees or more curvature, it, it, there are tells. To bleed. There are signs preoperatively that warn you of that, but, but not always. And what are those signs? Well, 
certainly when you examine and you put your fingers at the penis scrotal junction and see a significant amount of bending, you should be worried. But other signs are the humps, where these corners of the prepuce are, you know, typically like they are in this patient, that's going to be a blip this one here. They're out distally. If you see those humps more proximally along the kind of the mid shaft in that region, you should be very suspicious that even though it's a distal meatus, that's a, a form of a proximal hypospadias and that patient is likely going, going to need a staged repair. So this view just gives us great exposure. Yes, this is the same way that you would approach a penis for a um, foreskin reconstruction. And again, we know that many of you don't do that, but it's so easy. And many parents, it's what they want. And we've published that the complication rate is no higher urethroplasty or skin complication rate than if you do it with a circumcision. But, you know, our goal today isn't to convince you about propuceoplasty, just commenting that it's the same beginning of the operation to do. So again, we're going to make sure that we don't come up here, that we incise this dartos band near the skin, out distally. I need to hold it from back here, right here. right here and then we can see where to cut. So we're almost done with our degloving. We'll drop the scrotum down just a little bit more. Hardcore fans will remember we used to use the little handheld electric cautery yeah. device. We stopped using that when they changed the settings on it. And um, we found that it was either the, the, they did, instead of a medium one, they made a low dose and a high dose kind of cautery device. And the low dose was not strong enough and the high dose was too strong. So that got retired from our repertoire. And now we just do just like we always did in the proximals, using the Gerald's, in essence, as a, as a bipolar. And that's just our preference, because we prefer to use our hands instead of our feet like you would with the bipolar device. There's a bleeder on this side, I think. As usual, when you get down towards the scrotum, there'll be those small blood vessels that we cauterize. See if there's anything else in Dartos that we need to release. Yeah, right here, that's part of the torsion, isn't it? It is, and we're going to release this up instead of down because this could potentially become part of our flap after we do his distal repair. There's a blood vessel in that. right in this corner, it dropped down. Right, that, that blood vessel right there. Oh, yep. Okay. Good. You might have something similar here. So again, we're kind of planning each step of the way where our dartos need, tissues need to be.
Still unhappy. Other side of it. Check our erection. We're going to take these stays off so that they don't pull anything down. As we've mentioned before, we don't use a tourniquet. He's perfectly straight in terms of no curvature. He's still got that little bit of residual torsion yeah, that you can see. And so we will get to that, but we're not going to get to that aspect right this second. So now we can go ahead and continue with our hypospadias repair, or we can go ahead and deglove. And I don't think it really makes a difference at this stage in the game, which one of those you want to do. Which one are we going to do? Well, I don't know. We'll, I, I think it's best for video purposes to be able to put a tourniquet around so we can see, but we've actually almost already come full circle here, so I Try think again. we'll just leave him how he is and Right, so we've one to a hundred times had some questions from folks in terms of where do we make our glands, wings, so incisions. Again. So I'm just kind of freshen up the marks too here. But we make it right, you can see the junction well, of you where... You can't see it right this second, but when he moves his hand you'll be able to yeah. see. There you go. Okay. Then we go right along that junction, same thing here, right along that junction and then down where the kind of more red mucosa for the urethral plate and meets another, the glands sorry. wings. Another question is, how high do we make the incisions? And the glands wings incisions go up, right up to the tip of the urethral plate. So I'm gonna bring this up to show you because of the angle of our camera. Do you see where the urethral plate ends, which is right here? That's where the end of that pink mucosa is in, in our Glands, wings, incisions will come right up to that. You don't want your tip incision to go past that area because that will be visible, but your glands, wings, incision should go all the way up there if and you're you going to do the glands approximation like we do it. Right. You don't want to cut into the, well, we don't ever cut into the glands as part of the tip incision if we cut right up to the end of it. Now we have a tourniquet on and we're going to go ahead and inject some epinephrine too. There's a lot of superstitions about tourniquets and epinephrine so we just use both. But the key is, we've said this in every film we've made, the surgeon has to see the anatomy clearly and, and sometimes the tourniquet alone isn't enough and sometimes the injection alone isn't enough and so we use both and then we see better. So now this incision needs to go again, just we go just through the epithelium, just along those lines that we've made. We don't try to cut it all in one fell swoop. Meaning we're not doing the gland swings dissection with the knife. Yeah. We're just cutting the epithelium and we're going to do the glands dissection with scissors under direct vision. Just get a little more of the blood out. Or the epinephrine out. Whatever the case may be. Like I said, sometimes you use both and they still bleed. Mm -hmm. want to make sure that we can see, but also that you can see. So we'll be patient for a moment. We'll be patient to say that, you, you notice, I mean, we're not measuring anything. We're not looking at the plate and going, I need my wings a little wider or a little narrower or whatever. We, don't, we just don't do any of that. 
we look at where the urethral plate joins against the glands, and that's where the incision goes every time. We just have an artery over yeah, here, yeah, believe it or weird. not, which is really strange. I think I'll just hold that and we can oh, dissect we can the other side. And it helps for me to hold that angle wise maybe up towards you guys just a little bit anyhow. Maybe keep these lights on. Okay. So now we're gonna begin that dissection to free off the gland's wings. Everything wants to bleed all of a sudden. Take this all the way up to our cut edge. You can see there's just a little bit of glands tissue that needs to be cut in there. And you can see all this lengthening as we do that. And that looks pretty good. Let's come back. really plastered, I think starting right down here, because that's some skin. Let's cut this, because that's going to prevent me from helping to hold very well. because it, the, the corpora aren't completely flat. This is really a great image there where you can see, I'm going to hold that up towards the you. the corpora, here's the glands wing. And, and look how adherent right here this mucosal collar is. It's right there. You can see this band that's coming in right there and that's going to prevent your glands wing from being fully dissected open wide which could put some tension on your closure and potentially contribute to some glands dehiscence. It's a little bit different. Remember, he's twisted some, so his anatomy is a little different on one side than the other. So now we're going to see where there's symmetry here for you. Can you wipe that? Can you um, zoom in, which is the T button on the remote? More, 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 more. Right there, good. 
So we're going to show you right here. Now you can see there's a little band, just like we cut on this side. We're going to cut over here to open that up. And up here, you can see a, a band that's in a different spot, but those are bands that need to be released as part of our dissection here. Now this one, we have to be really careful because it's very easy to get into the mucosal collar right there. And so you want to leave some of the dartos with the mucosal collar as you do that dissection. And that really helps to open up that gland swing. And then we will do this side. Again, we already dissected this lower portion off, but we can just feel there's not symmetry there. And you can see that there's not symmetry with this band that's coming right up and down there. And now that we've released that, we should have nice wide open gland swings that can come together without any tension. You need something there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So it is an important question, we'll take one second to, to say this, you know, again, how high do you dissect the gland swings? And there's two schools of thought. This is what we do, and you see we're right at or just slightly below the end of the urethral plate, which is right here. We're almost even with it. Some people don't open it this far. They open it just to there and leave this all attached because it, in their mind, that's going to be part of the meatus anyway. So let's just make the point that this is how we do this, and so this is a this is the landmark here. How far you open it, and then all of this is going to be in size. So that sets up the whole operation. Is we take the gland swings up to that point. Keep this right there. Now we're going to incise our urethral plate, and I'm going to hold this up for you. I don't normally put my finger back behind it, but because the angle shows a little better for you guys, I'm going to do that right now. And so that's the end of the plate, visually. We don't go past that. And we're just going up and down from within the meatus, staying right in the midline. And we're just going to keep going till we get to the corpora underneath. You can feel it with the scissors, which is why we use scissors and not a knife, because I think I feel it better that way. And Hopefully you can there. see that too, all these tissues releasing under yeah. here. And now we're down. I mean, that's corpora right there. You can see how beautifully wide this is and how there's going to be absolutely no tension on that urethroplasty closure at all. Yeah, let's make sure that y'all get a really good view of that, that that's a properly incised plate. And please don't look at this and go, well, you only have a millimeter of tissue and a millimeter of tissue, so you have this huge raw area that might scar. Well, it doesn't. And lots of data, not just our own, show that. We use a six. six All right. So now we're going to freshen up this bottom area here. <coughs> Our incidence of stricture after a distal tip is less than one half of one percent. Meta analysis of strictures after distal tip shows one percent strictures. If you inc incise the plate this way, you should not get a stricture. So I, how did we decide to do yeah, that? Just wait a second. Ironically, if you don't incise the plate that, that deeply and you tubularize it, you may end up with a stricture because you didn't make an adequate size neo-urethra. So now we're taking off this extra skin that was just that tissue that was below the meatus, just because we don't need it in the urethroplasty. I think that was what you wanted to say. I did. 
just going to say that and then come back to your exact point by not incising deeply enough you can create a heck of a lot more problems than it's we've so ever ironic. seen by incising deeply enough yeah. and, and, and again we've said this before but it, it can't be repeated too many times that visitors who come and watch us who say I'm having trouble with meatal stenosis or I've had some strictures and they watch us and they go, oh, I, I thought I was incising the plate the way you described, but now I see that I wasn't making it as deep. We've heard that over and over. Nobody's ever come and said, oh, I, I, I'm cutting it too deep. No one has ever said that. Our previous viewers will also note that we have a different catheter in place. We loved the Kendall, aka Dover catheter, they, they renamed it, which was a six French celastic catheter, but they have alas stopped making it. So now we use these <coughs> six French feeding tubes, and for a small glands, like a 13 millimeter or less glands, we actually use a five French feeding tube because we don't want any tension on our glands closure. But we measured this boy at the beginning of the case, and what was he? 15. He was a 15, so. His glands. His glands width. Okay, so now we've secured the catheter. So now we'll begin the tubularization, and she's going to put some marks here. Put some. She's going to put some marks here to show exactly where the stitches go, and this would be a, a good, you know, thing to do at home too, or especially if you work with trainees, so that everyone sees exactly the right thing. So that's the the end the of cut the cut edge, the very tip of the plate. For here, I'm going to go ahead and mark the corona again. We marked it earlier, but our marks have come off. So that's just the corona. So that's the, the corona. And where our goal is, is to go exactly midway between those two marks, which is here and here. This is for the begin the urethroplasty. And we'll also do that in a similar location on the glands wings later. So. We've got our mark here, our mark here, the corona. We're going to go right in the middle, here, here, right in the middle. So those are all very similar landmarks. And again, I'm going to hold this up towards you so that you can see that. Which will be challenging to operate. All right, I'll turn it towards you just a little if you need some. Okay. So again, we're going to pick up by that mark. And we put the first stitch through the epithelium. I'm using 70 Vicryl on a TG, what, 140? Is that what it is? Yes, sir. We use this because we like the needle. It's much, much smaller than any needle that's available on PDS. So you You've read from us many times that the opening on the urethra plate should be oval and not round. And you see that's exactly what it is. It's oval, not round. And then we're gonna, in a distal, we run this stitch down. So we'll do that. our first suture distally was epithelially because it's so important to get that at the exact right spot and not take it up too far distally. But now all the rest of our sutures will be sub-epithelial.
funny, we haven't changed the tip technique in terms of these key steps, where to do the glands dissection, what, how deeply to cut the plate at, at all since you developed the technique a quarter century ago. But minor things like our skin incision and how we're going to test the urethroplasty here in just a few moments have changed. So it's fun to keep you updated on that. is meatus is angled a little bit too. Just like that female skin was from the torsion initially. So it's a little bit tricky to get it just right. One trick I used to do when I worked with lower level trainees was mark this proximal edge with um, a marker to be sure that all that epithelium was turned inward here so that you can avoid a fistula. And again, in a distal, we run it down and tie a knot and then run it right back up. so we can get a good look here to see a little artery on this side. Something in there. Just a little bit. I'm just going to take a look right here to see if this is just some epithelium or if that's the other side of... I think that's just some epithelium there. Do we want to inject now? or after our second layer. So I'm just trying to decide if I want to put one here yes. and then run out. Okay. I think we've got a little bit of epithelium right mm -hmm. here that we want to excise. see everything optimally here, so it's a square towards my concern. It just wants to ooze. understand from y'all's emails that a lot of you use 70 PDS and we just can't comment to that because we've never used it for our first layer of our urethroplasty. Uh, and, and we haven't again because of the needle. The needle is just bigger. So we're, we're not saying better or worse but we will say that what we're showing you is you know how we do it and we know our results. And if you are doing some step differently, then you really, really should tally your results to make sure that you're 
doing as good or even better than we are. If you're doing the same as we are, then obviously whatever you're doing differently is one of those things that doesn't matter, like the suture perhaps. If you're doing something and you're consistently getting better results than we are, we want you to tell us. Because we'll change. The whole goal is to have the fewest complications possible. And if you check your results and find that, sure enough, you're having more complications than what we are, well then you need to look at what you're doing differently and say, huh, I didn't think that really made a difference, but I guess it does. And that, that should be just ingrained into us from the beginning of surgical training for reconstructive surgery, and, and sadly it's not. Every surgeon needs to know exactly their own results. And you can't assume that your results are the same as our results unless you document that they are. <laughs> Prove it to yourself because it's your patients who benefit from that. do a white backdrop, backdrop but it makes it really tough for y'all to see on the camera okay so there's our two layer sub epithelial closure and we've started doing this I, we've never filmed this I don't think of putting in an angiocatheter after we do it and just pressurizing that with some fluid and just checking we really started doing that on proximal ones but we'll do it on all of them now a little vein. There's a vein. There. Yeah, you'll see some fluid come out of vessels, but there's no leak. Sometimes there is, and then you realize, oh, I need another stitch right there. So it's, a, I think we think that's a good habit to have. Just to check. And now we're going to finish making this ventral dartos flat to cover things. You obviously could make this from dorsal tissue, but then you'd have to take down all this retraction and go up there and get it, and then bring it down here, and then set all that back up again. And, and even if you deglove completely at the beginning of the case, you still would have to take all your retraction down to go get that, and, and we just find this is easier and quicker. And you can feel these little bands tension of tension that are right in this region yeah so now there, there's absolutely zero tension on this and you can you can see that it's lax I mean that's the end of the plate right there and, and this is plenty lax I know so now we'll tack that into place we happen to use a nino vicro now but for many years we used a 7 of Vicryl. It's the same size needle, just a smaller suture. And, you know, this, the superstition is that suture causes reaction. Let's use the least amount and the smallest that we can do to accomplish the task. So this I know is, it's really hard to see on the blue backdrop. Yeah. <coughs> This is only to hold this flap up in place, so you don't need a big stitch to do that. Tack it to each side.
again, having this very fine needle allows for a very precise placement of that stitch. We do a barrier layer in every single urethroplasty. A two layer closure and a barrier layer. Every case. And we have very, very few fistulas as a consequence. Do you need any more to detect that or is it good? It feels pretty pretty good, but it won't hurt okay. if you want to step another one down there. Okay, so now we're gonna start the glands plastic. Marker. And she made marks, but they get wiped off or whatever, so she's gonna do it again to show. Remember that we marked in the middle of the glands. This is a nice way to do it. If your assistant kind of holds it, and then you can look. So the corona is right there. And it the needs cut edge is right there. Here. So again, about halfway, about like that. Should be right. Another way to look at it is that the glands distance when we are finished from here to there needs to be about four millimeters. That's another way to look at it. Now we're gonna make sure that we have it set up right by putting an alignment stitch in, and we're gonna use the 9-0 for that. This is not to, for part of the closure, it's to make sure that we're starting this properly aligned in the correct place. If you don't have access to a 9-0 and you use a 7-0 or something bigger, you can always just remove it later. But it can be very helpful, especially in a redo or a small glance, to get all this set up and be sure that you have symmetry from this suture down to your corona. Yeah, before you start closing the glands up. We've seen people come to us who the glands are, are at different heights on each side. And that creates tension in the repair. But we can see here that this looks symmetric, this distance here to and here, this distance. And here to here. And if we stick a ruler on that, which we will when we're done yeah. closing it, it will be a distance of about four millimeters. So now with that done, we'll just lift this up and the first stitch will go right at the point of that alignment stitch, just finding a place the needle wants to go. We don't need a very big bite of this one. So just like in our proximals, our goal is usually three sutures for our glansplasty. One at the mid portion of the glands, one at the corona, and one in between there, but not in that order. I just haven't come up with a better way to say it. Well, the first stitch, as she just said, goes in the mid glands. The last stitch goes at the corona, and then there's one in between. So the exact same thing she just said. We all like mansplaining, though. Sounds yes, better. It, it is when mansplaining. It, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why we need the term mansplaining. It's just splaining. So there's our first stitch, and then the second stitch will go down just a little bit from there. Get a good bite. Again, uh, that's so good. I it liked was, it. but I wanted a little bit more like that. And usually this thing is laying up a bit lower. It is true. I'm holding it. At, a, at an inconvenient yeah. angle for you, yes. for the good of our viewers. And now we're going to catch some of that Dartos flap because otherwise as you close the glands it can tend to push down and not be covering over all your suture line. So that's just a good way to keep it from doing that. And I don't know if we made this clear, but this is a 6-0 Vicryl on what needle? 
The TG100-8. We just think the 70 Vicryl may be a little it's too small. flimsy for this important of a series of stitches. And now a third stitch will go right at the corona. And this is this accounts for over 95% of our glands plasties, three stitches. Occasionally the configuration of the glands or side it just doesn't allow you to put three, so we'll put two. But, but, but very rarely. Very rarely. And this, as I've told some of our courses before, is my favorite stitch in a distal hypospadias <laughs> repair. It is because it's this third suture right at the corona that really gives that glance its normal look and shape. Be a little lower. I should be lower. Towards you, yeah. This kid, we may even get a fourth suture in. It's like a bonus stitch. And I think we have him aligned correctly, but again, the shape of him. No, it, it's not quite right. Let me do one more on this side that needs to go to there. superficial right here because we're just a little deeper on that last suture on um, we're deeper on this right side than we were on the left side and so that gives it just a little bit of asymmetry that this one extra suture is going to help to even out whether or not that makes any difference I have no idea well, if, it, if it's not right though, then we'll, we'll also take out that last stitch that's exactly it right be, it has to be right It's just, there's a, maybe you went through the skin on that second one. It's four. Let's see if we see the suture over there. I think it was just a superficial yeah. bite. I don't like it. Okay. I, I just don't like it. This is not how it should look when we're done. Six out of me. We don't hesitate to do this if something's not right and we disagree with how things are looking. Then we just cut it right out and redo it. It can be tricky with the knots that are in here sometimes.
So again, that first suture going right where our distal most marking suture is. Yeah, I saw the needle come through that back side and I thought that yeah, I thought I when you reposition, in, yeah. but it was just a little too superficial to the skin. It was causing that wrinkle in it. Well, I think a critical point to make is that whenever your mind thinks, oh, that's good enough, it's probably not. It's just every stitch in a, in a hyperspace repair needs to be right. And we have to live with it. My trainees have heard me say this. We have to live with it right now, but the, the patient has to live with what we do for the rest of their life. And so we just, we has to be right. Yeah, that's better. It was that, that, that second stitch suture was right there. And, and you were exactly right. The needle went through the epithelium of the glands, and I pulled it back and repositioned mm -hmm. and thought I had it right. But then when we, we both thought you it, had it right. Yeah, but, but then it wasn't. And so, you know, you just, you have, yeah, see, it was indented in, and you could see it, and now it's correct. So it wasn't right, and now it is. We think that this is one of the reasons why a surgical team is better than doing this with a nurse or really even a trainee. There is nothing minor about distal hypospadias, although many people tend to treat it that way. And with complication rates averaging 20% in many series, it's just really important that we redouble our efforts to get these cases right. So we'll hold so that up for you, for you to see, ruler. And so the distance from the tip of the meatus to the corona should be about four millimeters and you see that it is and that's what a typical <coughs> pair done like this routinely accomplishes and if you look in our database for the glands fusion number you just see a row of fours an occasional five an occasional three but just four after four after four after four so now we've got this little bit of epithelium right in here it is right here Hold this right here, please. It's trying to tear already on this here. I'm going to take the 9 0 in one second. So now she's going to start working on the mucosal collar. And again, here's a little bit of epithelium, and these little things you have to be very careful about because that will leave. Um, an inclusion cyst if it's not dealt with. So it would be nice to be able to take all of this off, but I'm afraid if we do that, that this, this is going to be too tight. And so what we'll do is we'll just, th this, remember his median raffae was coming in from over here, mm -hmm. and so we couldn't quite get this fold for the median raffae off. So we're going to close it, and then we'll trim that kind of ridge that he has off. So these are adjustments that are having to be made because of the small amount of torsion that he had. We have learned that boys who have distal hypospadias with torsion, boy, they're a separate group and, and they really can be challenging and they can have a higher complication rate if you don't really get the skin just right because it will put tension on the repair and, and increase the likelihood of a fistula or glands dehiscence. Which is one reason we wanted to film this today. This is not a severe tour. I mean, certainly they can be twisted all the way around to 3 o'clock. But even this one 
starting out between 5 and 5.30, it changes these little nuances and you have to be cognizant of them and adjust for them. So you can do a subepithelial suture here, but it's much harder in some ways. And, and so that's why we like this little 9 ohm because we can put it through the epithelium without a fear of it leaving a major suture tract that then has to be dealt with later on down the road. And you can see actually that now the median refe itself is kind of lined up right at the exact nor you know, normal midline spot that it should be. So we might just leave that in that regard. Yeah, no, that looks, fun. It looks really nice there. Kind of gives them a little frenulum. So now at long last, we have to de-glove. Can you um, zoom out now again, Sally? Marking pen. So we like to leave a short mucosal collar here because mucosal collars swell post-op and it can make a turkey gobble-like appearance. Can you block that, please? And by leaving a nice short collar, you're gonna have less of that post-op swelling. and in patients who come here from other countries, we've learned that, that Americans tend to make larger mucosal collars, which we think is probably because so many boys here have a Gomco or Plastibel Cirq, so we're used to seeing a longer collar, but especially all, everyone listening has seen those things swell and create that turkey gobbler appearance, which is not, you know, optimal, and the parents don't really like that. So it was actually a family from Italy who came here, and I, I don't know why they wanted their boys circumcised, but they did. And so we, we did it in the typical way, this is years ago, and they were so disappointed with his circumcision. We were like, what's wrong with it? One without it. And they said, you let, there's too much skin. It was the mucosal collar, not the outside. It was the mucosal collar. And it swelled a little bit. And they were like, this is not right. And then we learned that Europeans, when they do a circumcision, typically leave almost no mucosal collar. We've got stuff in this picture. A thing suture. Yeah. All right. I think you got most of it. That's it. I think you should. The one creating, I agree, nine of eight. Cover that up. So this is our mucosal collar. We talked about putting a stitch down here too and didn't do it, but now we see that we won't. Um, we usually do put stitches a little lower to, to tack it in place. to skin reconstruction, many folks yes, many folks do this from the dorsal surface and come around to the ventrum. I don't think that's wrong to do. Well, but that's good because that's the way I taught you to do it. <laughs> but it's not how I like to do it. And I don't like to do it that way because 
we're going to end up potentially with some tighter, shorter skin right in this mid-shaft region. And I, I like to kind of adjust this all at the beginning right now. And I also think in a patient like this where the scrotum was, it was really about right here. And we want to drop that down to give the penis the longest appearance of, of length that we can. And so in that regard, we're going to go ahead and do his um, minor scrotoplasty here marker. We'll need the 5 PDS. Mm -hmm. By just marking the penoscrotal junction, just like we do in all of our proximals. We don't do it in every distal, but if it goes through your head, whether or not a patient could benefit from it, I would say do it. This reflects the, a difference in how she sees skin than how I did in the past, and, and she does most of our skin stuff now. But, but what's important is not whether you go from top down or from bottom up, however you see it. What's important is that you correct any transposition, and also that the final result, that you have symmetric ventral skin to dorsal skin, and we do continue to see an unfortunate large number of boys where the skin has not been sized correctly and they're really deficient of ventral skin. And, and that includes in boys with failed distal repairs. In fact, we did one the other day from a, a quite renowned surgery center in the United States where the skin was just absolutely horrific, so mis missized and misshapen on a distal repair. So it is important to look at all of these details and to not, for the faculty person, not to like leave the room when the skin closure is being done because mistakes can happen. Uh, that's the only excuse we could come up with on that patient. He looked like his penis was going to fly away. He had it's such excess weird skin on the sides, on the side, and it was too short ventral. on the ventral surface. Yeah. And it was quite terrible. So when there's shorter skin, I really like to put this suture on a mosquito down here to make sure that we size the skin correctly. because we're gonna borrow some length. We need some length over on this side. So show that for people that are like One, me two. and don't see it so readily. Clean them up so we can see things better here. So very, very commonly in boys with both distal hypospadias and penile torsion, you're gonna end up with shorter skin on this left side because his meatus was down low, the penis was twisted that way, the median raffe was off, and so we really have to accommodate for that skin that's missing over there. So if we just pull up on our stay sutures like we had before, and you can you see, can see the, the difference um, that's on there. You can, I don't know, I guess we probably have to keep it where we are, but but it's shorter by a couple of millimeters, which doesn't seem like a big difference, but at the at the end of the day, it, it really can be. And typically, if kids are going to be short of skin, it's going to be right over here on the left side. So I like to borrow some of this skin, and for me, it just makes sense to do it on the each side at a time instead of going right here at 12 o'clock because you, if you go right at 12 o'clock and you're missing skin here, you can, I think that's how people end up with those really tight, narrowed waists of skin and, and they don't have enough skin 
to deal with. Because they're just going down the middle. Because they're going down the so middle. So they're getting equal distribution right. when you need But you're not equal because you're missing skin on the left. So right. then it's too short on the left. If we do it from the ventral surface, then I can borrow some of the skin that I need to because I haven't committed anything back there. And so we're going to borrow it just by incising in towards this hump where we had before. And incising some of that dartos to help stretch that out and bring it right around. So that now we're much more even in terms of our skin and we don't have any folds of skin that we need to worry about back there. Let me have a 7-0 or a 5-0 or anything. And I just like to tack this really quickly to, to be sure that I like how everything is lining up. And then we're going to zip up our skin from the bottom up and then we'll finally turn it to the dorsal <coughs> surface. And that has really I think made it where we don't tend to have the skin shortages that people talk about because we adjust for it before we make any cuts. And so we can both sew. There's this little scrotal incision here that if it's a longer scrotal incision we close it with a 6-0 with a little short one like that. We usually just use a 7-0 a seven bike. Yeah, but this little one is just 7-0 bike. going to stress in our master class series more about skin. It's interesting whenever there's a course on hypospadias or a panel discussion or any of those things, it seems that it's almost always focused on the urethroplasty. Every now and then there'll be a special emphasis about straightening curvature and never is there an in-depth discussion about nuances of skin closure ever? I've never heard that. And wow, have we learned how important it is, not just from the aesthetic standpoint, but from the functional standpoint. Because if the goal of hypospadias surgery is to take the abnormal anatomy of hypospadias and make it into a normal penis, a normal penis has symmetric penis skin circumferentially, the same on the top as on the bottom. And so we have to create that. And, <coughs> excuse me, so many boys that we see that have been operated on by colleagues, that has not been achieved. Or if it was achieved, it didn't take didn't stay. So that's why we're emphasizing that and we're showing you a, a different way to approach the skin than what many of you might be accustomed to, but you, you see why now. If you just go and cut those symmetric buyer's flaps on the top, which is what most of us do, and just rotate that skin around as a flap, you're not going to get the same redistribution of the skin. You're not going to take into account focal deficiencies, particularly when there is some twist of the penis. But you don't have to have penile torsion to have that. No, it, it's just, uh, you know, sometimes the scrotum will be hiked up higher on the left side than it is on the right, just to begin with, so that the boy has an asymmetry that you know, was just there from the from the beginning. We don't want to leave him with that if we have any choice in the matter. Well, and that's a good observation that when you look, the next boys you operate on, at the very beginning of the case, look and see if the penis scrotal junction is symmetric on both sides, because it often is not. And so that's another way of saying if it's higher on the left, then you have a left penis skin deficiency. 
It's the almost same thing we're talking about right here. Right. It's almost always on the left. So this, this is this little corner right here was where his meatus was. That's just where we marked. And so, so now imagine it, if we try to pull that up <laughs> towards the, it's just too tight. So all of this yeah, is skin right. flap that we've wrapped around. And I, I cut off the little corner right here. It's close to symmetric on this side, but, but again, it's just a little bit higher on the right than it is on the left side. And then one thing that we'll come back to is that it, it looked like once we cut his urethral plate that things evened out in terms of his penile torsion. But if they hadn't, then that's something that we would need to address at this juncture as well. And we would do that with a dartos flap on the penile skin that we would have wrapped around from the dorsal surface across midline to the left side that would help um, rotate that in a clockwise fashion to correct that counterclockwise torsion. Oh man, you know what we should have done? We should have marked it the way everyone does it. Yeah, and then shown where it ended yeah, up going. See, I didn't think about that. I didn't either. It would have been fun. Next time. Well, since you've started doing these repairs from this direction, we haven't needed to do that dark test flap. I don't recall the last time we did that to the torsion. It's been a torsion. long time. And I, I think, again, that, that's a nice trick to do that. Barry Kogan is the one who published it, and I've done it many times, but I think that my eye wasn't seeing that part of that twist was, create, was creating a left skin deficiency, and you don't get rid of it unless you address specifically that deficiency, and I probably wasn't doing that. So I got around it by making that flap. But there's another way to do it, and you need to get this skin symmetrical so it takes care of both at the same time. And you can see that if, the, if this family wanted him to have a natural look, well, there it is. Mm -hmm. It's not hard. You just to have do. to cut a little bit asymmetrically, which is why we put these stays, but don't cut all the way towards them because you, you often have to tailor that for their actual skin that, that they have, especially when a penile torsion is present. Yeah, when I started doing it, I put the stays in the corners and I just cut to those stays and then wrapped it all up. And this case shows that those stays were in the very corners of the prep use, but they're not now. No, they're, they're in slightly different spots. Not yeah. a lot different, well, but, the, the but left, a little bit. Do you, do you yeah. see that? I mean, the there, there's still a touch lower. And so what we would do is, it, you know, what we did do is kind of cut up just in a little bit different direction than what that stay was. So you could and that would, would make it more even there without your skin discrepancy. All right, so now that we know and can see that we have nice, even penis skin, we don't have any tight areas, now it's very easy to go ahead and draw your circumcision line marker. And so we can just remind ourselves where his glands is. Because we left a short collar, we'll cut essentially right to the glands. And I generally eyeball it, but if there's any question in my mind, Actually, we'll take a ruler and measure from their penoscrotal junction here to our line. That's 31 millimeters. Did I, did I do it right over here? 31 millimeters. So that's one good way to check yourself. You can you know, do it along the dorsal surface too and the ventral surface just to be sure that you're in that same ballpark of 30 to 31 millimeters for this for this penis and then you know you're symmetric as you're doing that
right here will go up just a little bit to get rid of that last little bit of hump. And then this is a good way to double check and be sure you're taking off the right amount of skin because you can see your glands back there. You want to be sure you don't cut into your mucosal collar. We're leaving it uh, just a millimeter or so longer so that we don't cut it too short. We don't need this for graft, unlike most of our patients. I do like to do is, is to bring this dartos up just a little bit and, and cut that off because sometimes that's tethering things just a little bit back here and you can see that he still kind of has I don't know it's not it's not perfect back there or is it not perfect well it's, it, if there was any hump we could make a little cut right here which is sometimes a, a necessary thing and this kid I don't think we actually need to do one. that but but sometimes there will be, and it'll be from this remnant dartos in here, that if you incise that, that will kind of get rid of that little hump, but, but sometimes you have to adjust your skin incision just a little bit to make sure that you're taking off enough. Seven of them. the operation with interrupted subepithelial 7 ovicral suture, the same as we used in the urethroplasty. And again, we'll just emphasize that if you interrupt the stitches, you can place everyone exactly where it needs to go, and they really should be subepithelial. Please do subepithelial sutures. Man, we've seen some ugly train track penises here in this room, and that's from placing baseball sutures through the skin. Again, it's worth the extra few moments that it takes to align the skin and put in these little subepithelial stitches. So, you know, we see adults with hypospadias, and that is truly an eye-opening experience. And many adults who come to us, one of the things which distresses them about their appearance is that ruffled circumcision line that they have. They, many of them, specifically point to that and say, and doctor, can you get rid of this while you're at it? I hate this. And, and I think many people just don't give any thought to what that's going to look like in a, you know, 20-year-old guy when they're operating on a six-month-old baby.
easier said than done. No, I right. do it all the time, but mm -hmm. these pickups are not grabbing it. a couple more points as we finish and one is that as she said at the beginning we only decide if a patient needs a different operation than tip based on whether they have ventral curvature not based on the shape of the urethral plate the width of the urethral plate nothing else and that's been for 20 something years and we have consistently published success in over 90% of our distal repairs consistently so we know that you don't have to worry about the shape of the urethral plate or whether it has good spongiosum or not whether it's favorable or unfavorable too narrow too wide too deep too flat whatever we, don't, we just don't think about any of that because you don't need to. And that frees you to just focus on doing these steps in the best possible way. Secondly, we've learned that we, we just don't do the traditional circumferential degloving incision at the very beginning of the case that we used to do because this gives us a lot of flexibility that you don't get that way. So it's okay as long as the penis is straight, but many boys with distal meatuses, a third of them have curvature that needs to be addressed and there's more flexibility for that too if you begin the operation ventrally rather than dorsally. So that's why we do that. The mosquito in might make it a little easier to see your side. Maybe, maybe not. Thirdly, as always, we do sub-epithelial closures of the urethra and of the skin and of the glands. You notice we didn't say it, but we should say it now. We we only do a single layer glands closure. Our glands dehiscence rate in distal hypospadias is 2%. So you don't need two layers of sutures and you don't need stitches in the epithelium of the glands. So please, if you're doing that, reconsider it because it does leave marks. Especially if dehiscence occurs, it doesn't prevent the dehiscence, and and then you get these huge gashes in the glands, which are just awful looking awful. as they grow up, and sometimes impossible to totally get rid of. And we've had men specifically point to those too and say, "Can you get rid of these gashes in the head of my penis?" Men who grow up who had hypospadias as a child want their penis to look normal and so everything that we can do in this little boy to give him a normal penis is what our job is and then finally please if you don't know your own personal results if you've never tallied them please just make that a resolution to do it. Go do a retrospective review of your results or start a little database and just put the data in it prospectively. Whichever you do, just do that so you can see is your complication. Do you have success with no fistula, glands dehiscence, stricture, meiosinosis in over 90% of your patients? because everyone doing hypospadias should be able to accomplish that. And now she'll show you the bandages that we use. I'm 
with the calipers. Just remeasure our glands real quick. Blue towels, picture as well, family. And I'm going to say I hope that that was helpful to you and that you enjoyed it. I will step away and she's going to finish the bandages. Thanks for joining us. So this is the same bandage that we've used now for quite a long time. Make sure that we get all the blood squeezed out as much as possible. Just a little bit here on the side. And as we're cleaning them, I like to again just apply some pressure to stop up any bleeding and try to prevent as much edema as possible while we get just a little bit of compression on. You don't want much compression because of course you don't want to interrupt any of the blood flow in or out of the penis. You don't want lymphedema being a stasis of any sort, but it sure does help in terms of just how the family perceives their healing when they have less swelling and bruising versus more swelling and bruising, and, and it might ultimately affect how well their skin, you know, looks and functions in terms of gliding, etc. So I think that um, putting a bandage that's Safe. You want something that's easy to, to you know, fall off, um, but secure in terms of providing a little bit of compression to help with hemostasis. I think all of that is important. So we do the single layer of the tegaderm to keep the catheter in place, basically. It's like an insurance stitch in addition to our gland stay suture. And then we do two layers of 4 by 4s and tegaderms because babies tend to kick a lot. And by having the two layers on, it tends to help with that. There's a little string remnant that got caught in there. This just secures it right here where they tend to kick it off. And if they kick it off too much, then um, they can get some scrotal hematoma that's there, and that will help with that, especially in the proximals. So this bandage will fall off at some point after surgery. There's not a particular day that we ask for it to fall off. We'll tend to have them sponge bathe for about four days after surgery so that the catheter will, I mean, so that all of this will stay in place as long as possible. Once you start bathing them, this tends to fall off pretty quickly. And then once the bandages fall off, we just have them moisturize the skin to help that heal. Uh, usually we use a little bit of aquaphor, which is like a petroleum plus lanolin, but I'm not sure it really makes too much difference what you're using to moisturize as much as that you are moisturizing catheter will stay in place for five to seven days depending on what day of the week their surgery is on 
husband will um, alternate Tylenol and ibuprofen and for older children we'll give them a little bit of an anticholinergic when they're over age one while the catheter is in place. So if you have any questions you can always reach out to us at info, info at hypospadius.com and thanks for joining us today.